a great show planned for you guys. Um, I, I want to say this. We are airing this show live and you are watching this live, but this was pre-recorded. So when you're watching this, you're actually watching this yesterday or watching it today, April the 2nd, but it okay. was recorded on National Joe Biden Day, which is April the 1st. You know why that's called National Joe Biden Day, right? Because April Fool's. Biden and Balagan goes yeah. together. <laughs> now, um, you guys will not be upset with me for... Biden and Balagan. Yeah, very much Balagan. Very, 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 very much. <laughs> um, okay, but here's the thing. Um, the reason why you are watching a live broadcast of a uh, recording is kind of important, right? Is because uh, the day that you are watching this is my eight-year wedding anniversary. So I am on the day that you are watching this. That's tomorrow from the time we're recording it. Hopefully. I've got a very special day planned for my wife. And I'm very excited about it. Wait a minute. It's supposed to be a surprise. So if you say it. Oh, so yeah, so not, it would be she wouldn't know. She's not going to hear this. She's not hearing this recording. She's not hearing Yeah, this. that's right. That's so right. So you can tell us what you're going to do? Yeah, we got all kinds of things. I got all kinds of things planned for her. I mean. Uh, we're, we're going to. There's going to be like a portion without the kids and a portion with the kids and then a portion without the kids. So, it. so, so, so you're doing an anniversary balagan. It's it's an anniversary balagan. <laughs> so the morning, I'm going to take her out. We're going to have a nice breakfast and kind of enjoy ourselves, and then um, we're going to do some fun things with the kids in the afternoon because the kids are always look. My theory is centered around um, the idea as a family tradition that our children should celebrate our anniversary as well because it's it's you. special. It's it's our our, our family is important. The structure is important. And and I want them. I want the children to see their father excited about the day that he married his mother. Amen. Their mother, right? Um, and the other thing is, is that when all that's done, uh, then my amazing sister will uh, watch our children for a few hours while I go do something else with Nicole. We're going to take her out to a nice dinner place and go eat something. She normally, like in an environment that you really can't take to kids, like kids to, like you know, like one of these. Korean barbecue places where, like, you know, a lot of nice you don't want on. the kids reaching over to, you know, the burning stove or anything like that. That's kind of what we're doing. So, you know, your wife doesn't like surprises. That's why she asked me to record this. And send it to her. <laughs> I, that's not my wife's MO. She doesn't roll that way. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, so yeah, we, bro, uh, we got a lot to talk about. Yes. Uh, a lot of things are happening. And um, yeah, I, I, it's kind of tying together. So, so yeah. What do we want to hit? Okay, so a couple of things right off the bat. Um, uh, and and I want everybody to know what we talk about is going to be very enriching for you. We're going to turn on your tour guide hat in a, in a big way. Okay. Because there are some things I want you to help everybody sort of understand. We're going to try to frame a few things. Um, I do want to make one quick note, and that is the fact that we are not going to be doing a locals show tonight or today because obviously I'm gone. But with, on that note... I'm so thankful for your support on Locals. If you have not supported us on Locals, I would ask that you go there and support us. I know our moderators will put up the link to be able to do that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, well, Locals, it goes immediately into the pockets of me and my family, and I, I very much appreciate that. And then also for your Super Chats and Super Stickers, our moderators will thank you. Um, and I better not be jumping on this show and commenting myself. I'll thank you at a later time, uh, because if I do, then that, that just won't be good. It's our anniversary. So, um, which is funny, you know, the way my wife thinks she was actually expecting me, I think still might be expecting me to work on Tuesday. That's not going to happen. Well, so if I say it now, does it work for tomorrow? So happy anniversary, yeah, James thank, and Nicole. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Happy anniversary. It's special. I, I, I will say this before we get into the subject matter. I told my wife that the day that we were married and I saw her in her in her bride's dress, I told her, I said, uh, today will be the ugliest you've ever been to me. And I think she almost immediately understood what that meant. Because what I meant was from that day on, she will always become more and more beautiful to me. And it's very, very true. She is so much more spectacularly beautiful to me today than she was the day I walked down the aisle with her. Interesting. And 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 it's it. That's the way a good marriage works, you know. And uh, and I think God's been so faithful, you know. And it's it's funny because you see the kind of insane. No offense to the women that watch us. You're all amazing ladies, but there are some really insane ladies out there. And I just say thank you, God, that you gave me who I have. Amen. And and I'm gonna well. Newly married myself. Yeah. I want to say yes. Thank God for for amazing women. Dude, and you're you're approaching a year in what August? Uh, we will be in July. Oh, July! It was around there, July August. 
It, yeah. You're already past the slight honeymoon stage. Like at oh, this yeah. point, we've actually when people don't of... have a solid foundation, they're already beating each other up. Uh, Not al- physically, but you know what we've I mean. Already, we've found that we even like to argue with each other. It's good. That's good. It's healthy. It's, it's amazing. Uh, the, the, the fact that God's the center of this relationship is, is an amazing um, experience. And, and again, you've been in it more longer than I am. But yes, thank God for beautiful women. Yeah, it is. It's a blessing. And uh, your wife is amazing. She's been a friend of mine for longer than you've known her. Yeah. that's For a long, long time. Actually, for 30 years. More than that. So, it's a blessing. Yeah. And, and, and it's kind of been. So happy anniversary. Bro. And and eat well. Okay. And, and <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a- l- let's do this. Can we talk about Damascus? Ooh. Short version or long version? Uh let's do the long. The, the, there's um there's a lot of folks that sensationalize all of this, right? We are doing Tom and I are doing uh we're gonna have a discussion on what happened in Damascus uh tomorrow. Um, at the time of the recording, we had assumed that the bombing was the embassy, or because that's what the reports were telling us, uh, actually the consulate. Um, and so we had offered some speculation as to what that might mean. Um, but now we know a little bit different. So talk to us. Uh, give us give us the rundown. Let's I, tell tell us the story. Let's like what happened, and then let's let's get into well, it a little uh, bit. Let's back up. A little bit on Damascus, okay. okay? Because we all we all know that Damascus is is part of the prophecy. We all know that Damascus was one of the most populated and most uh, sophisticated cities in the Middle Ages. Okay, undoubtedly. Anybody, anybody anybody ever heard the term Damascus steel? And I just heard that a little while ago. You never heard that term before? Well, I not and we don't use it in Hebrew. Okay, so yeah, so Damascus steel. And I'm saying to myself, wait a minute, I know a little bit about Syria. I mean, how can the Syrians do anything that is worldly renowned? It turns out that during the Middle Ages, Damascus was uh, the center of production of oh, very yeah. high-level steel. 100%. Who destroyed Damascus? You know the story of the, the Mongols. I don't know if you know, but the Mongols con- uh, conquered Damascus yep. and, and slaughtered in, in the most inhumane way possible. Very ugly picture. Very, very yeah. ugly. So yeah. so you know, so Damascus has all this history, but today Damascus is literally this this the center of, of a nothing nation. Yeah. Okay. Which brings us to what's going on today. Now a lot of people don't realize you see a map of Syria, okay? Damascus is not in the middle of Syria. Damascus is literally an hour drive from Israel. Yeah from that's the right. Heights. That's right. So um, when you go up on Mount Hermon, which is on the northern corner of, of Israel, you can actually look down into the outskirts of Damascus. And during the Yom Kippur War, after we had stopped their advance and pushed back, we were literally literally in the outskirts of, of Damascus itself. So Damascus is not way out in the middle of nowhere. It is very close to Israel. Yeah, and it's interesting. Uh, one of the, the discussions that I had with Tom uh, that everybody's going to get to hear tomorrow is um, is the fact that there's a, there's a lot of significance to the location of Damascus in in proximation to uh, Lebanon, specifically Beirut. And when you start looking from a map at Damascus and you kind of look at its specific location, you're almost kind of at like where uh, um, well well let me just say this: you're further west in Syria itself, right? And then you're kind of at the central eastern portion of uh, of Lebanon. Mm-hmm. And um, what's really interesting when you start thinking about the tunnels that Hezbollah is actually digging or believed to be digging now in central Lebanon, especially on the eastern border as it gets into, uh, gets into Syria, mm-hmm. a lot of people are thinking that it's being dug backwards into Lebanon by Hezbollah because of the presence of of many uh, Hezbollah factions that are in Syria right now. And so when we were talking about this bombing that was taking place, one of my speculations, or let me just say pontifications, is that um, Israel has a very vested interest in striking anybody right now who is encouraging the type of implicit behavior associated with the construct of anything that involves movement from nation to nation through tunnels with Hezbollah. Um, and, so, and so that was kind of a thought process in my head. I mean, obviously, southern Lebanon is the biggest problem right now, but I think central Lebanon, cent- the central eastern portion of Lebanon is going to become a bigger problem because of its proximation to Beirut. 
I mean, uh, 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 Damascus. So one of the things I need maybe people to understand a little bit about this, we have this tendency to organize the, the, the geography of the world into nation states. Yes. And, uh, Nation states, you know, you've got Canada on this side, you've got the United States, you've got right. Mexico, you've got nation states, you've got borders. This is a border between, you know, Colombia and this, this is a border between. Um, it turns out, and, and the Middle East has had nation states, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, you know, nation right, states. Right, that's right. But what we're seeing more and more is this smudginess of the nation state concept, okay? Because Syria, for instance, is not a nation anymore. Yeah, it's that's not a right. country. That's right. You're it's not right. a country. It's a free for all for all kinds of different forces. It is. Um, Lebanon is not a country as a country where we can. It's it's also a, a battleground for a lot of different aspects. And uh, Iraq, look what happened in Iraq. Oh, I yeah. mean, it's so so the the concept of the nation state is being eroded. The the, the armies, the governments. I mean, Bashar Bashar al Assad is not the actual defunct. Uh, president of Syria because he needs uh, the Iranians to hold him up on one side and the Russians to hold him up on the other side. So he's like Moses being held up because otherwise he lets his hands down and everything's going to fall apart. Uh, when you start looking at the Middle East, I need people to start looking at what we call the camps, the the the, the movements, okay? Yeah, that's and, great And insight. there's different movements running through the Middle East that if you kind of zone out a little bit, you start to pick them up. Okay, one of them is the Wahhabism, uh, ultra orthodox Sunni um, religiousness that uh, Osama bin Laden and and uh, ISIS and and Al Qaeda are our representatives yep, of. That's right. Okay, they're very religious. They're very and and they they kind of believe that the whole idea is. The pan Arab. I mean, take take Nasser, who thought that he could create an Arab nationality that didn't yeah. have the nation states. Add on religiousness. That's what Osama bin Laden kind of was connected to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting the Abdel Nasser discussion that can go for a long time. I mean, there's there's a lot of really smart wisdom in what you just said. Uh, can I also uh, uh, throw this other uh, picture out because? This is where Hamas ends up coming into play. Let's tie it all together. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. give me two more. Yeah, yeah. And I'll, yeah, and I'll go, put it No, together. please. Take, take, all, take all the time you need. Please. The next one is the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. Which basically says you don't need nations. You don't need anything. All you need is to be guided by Muhammad. And, and we're not succeeding because we aren't connected to Muhammad's teachings enough. And it's and it's not about a pan Arabism; it's about a pan Muslimism. Yeah, okay. and they're primarily Sunni, and they're still Sunni. Yeah, Muslim Brotherhood yeah. is complete yeah. Sunni. Then you've got the how do you say the the prodigal son, and the prodigal son is the Shia, where Sunni and Shia split because of political reasons. One guy got killed, and then there's a whole. Dip, but it doesn't matter. They were always the adopted son of Islam. Yep. Okay. And and uh, Iran is uh, Shia in, in, in that. And they are more into the idea of not only do we have to overthrow the um, Arab Muslim old dynasties, the way of dynamic, uh, we are the light of the world. Yeah, that's right. And we are going to bring the 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 Mahadi, the Mahadi, and and we are going to bring this new, and and it's not by chance that the Iranians call themselves revolutionaries. I mean, what are they revolting against? Yeah. They're revolting against everything that it is. So these three players are playing on, and there's always been an interaction. And the thing is this: Hezbollah, Iran, Houthis are part of that camp. Okay, Hamas, Muslim Brotherhood. Okay, are part of that camp, uh, ISIS and and do we do we understand that the, that uh, there's still elements of ISIS that are still fighting oh, elements of of the Iranians inside Iraq 100%, today. 100%. So so all of this is going on. Iraq, okay, is, is falling apart. So the question is not what nation we're dealing with, what camp. Yep. Now there's a fourth camp that a lot, when when we kind of try to explain Islam this way. The fourth camp is the camp that people don't really talk about it, and that is all the ones that are against Muslim fundamentalism, all the ones that don't want Muslim fundamentalism to break up the whole organization. Saudi Arabia, Jordan, hmm. Egypt, 
Okay? And here's the weird part. Who's a major player in that fourth camp? Israel. Yeah. So, so these four movements are kind of reacting. Okay, so how did that bring us to where we are today? What was blown up in Damascus? What was blown up in Damascus was a building that was not the uh, Iranian consulate, but the building right next to the Iranian consulate that doesn't have consular or, or diplomatic immunity. That's very important because that's a whole different dynamic, okay? That was the headquarters of the El Quds revolutionary guy. Okay, so we are not talking about the we are not talking about the uh, the consulate or the embassy. So where this building, where was it in proximity? Right next to it. The right next to it. I mean, okay. I mean, was whoever any... pulled off the attack, by the way, mm -hmm. managed to drop that building down without any major damage to the actual consulate. Was it an airstrike? It was. Yeah. Now, so uh, so now when I say airstrike, when you say airstrike, what does that mean? That means that the 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 um, the ordinance that brought the building down was dropped from an airplane. The question is, where was that airplane? I mean, sometimes the airplane doesn't even have to be inside Syria. Hmm. I mean, remember, Damascus is close enough that a, an airplane high enough over the Golan Heights, basically, could drop something that'll hit Damascus. Okay, so... Uh we don't have a doubt in our mind that this was Israel. No. There's, there, there's no doubt. I mean, Israel's not going to comment on it, but they, they, uh, have they commented on it yet? I think they've said, yeah, we, we, we have kind of taken responsibility. Um, but here, here's the thing. I want to remind you. What's the name of the organization? El Quds. What is El Quds? I'm not sure I understand where you're going with the... Jerusalem. Oh, I, meaning what, the, what does it mean? Yeah, that's right. When we say Otz in, in Arabic, that's what we mean. It, it's that's Jerusalem. Right. That's it right. is the Jerusalem bra yeah. Brigade of the Revolutionary Guard yeah. okay, in, yeah, in right. Iran. That's right. So it's the, it is the organization that was put together to fight for Jerusalem. Yeah. Now, Iran has no political aspirations in Jerusalem. Iran shouldn't have. I mean, we in Iran, before the, uh, the revolution, were, were allies. Okay, remember, Persia is not Arab. They're Muslim, but they're not yeah, Arab. That's right, that's right. Okay, so we were allies. So the only justification for Iran to fight against Israel is because they want to be the forerunner, the Mahdi. The, the, they want to hold the Islamic flag and take it away, the leadership of the Islamic world. There's, that's the only justification they have for fighting Israel. Yeah, and this is, this is in many ways a proxy war. Uh, Iran, what Iran is doing right now is a bit of a proxy war with Jordan. And, and I'll explain that in a okay. second. And of course, with Saudi Arabia, okay, uh, because you have you have a couple of major issues that are going on here, right? Jordan, uh, we all know about and Waqf and and Jordan, and they're the ones that that carry the responsibility of the guardianship of the Temple Mount, right? In Jordan, in in yeah, in Jordan, well, the Temple Mount in Israel, yeah, the Temple Mount in Israel. But these are the Jord it's Jordanians that carry that responsibility, and that's based on some agreements that were made as a result of the last war, where you we know pushed where back else and, a and waqf. Waqf. where else is there a waqf? Well, we know. That we're talking about Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. So, yeah. so what the Revolutionary Guard is trying to do is revolutionaries overthrow That's right. the old regime yeah. or the old religious regime. Now, remember, it's not nations. It's movement. It's, yeah, that's if very you want, smart. It's if very you want smart. For, for, for an understanding, it's a denomination. Yeah, it's okay? a very smart. It's a very smart approach because the statehood mindset is the is more of the secularist way of thinking. Uh, uh, and it, I think you're. I think you're absolutely and, and right. And here's something that's dawning on my mind. If you go back to European history, okay, think about the struggle, the war, the Cold War that was fought between Protestantism and Catholicism. Catholicism, okay, it wasn't a nation war. I mean, yes, there were nations on this side and there were nations on this side, but it was a war that was more than Italy against England. It was more than Germany against this. It wasn't a nation war. It was a fundamental religious movement war that actually came or uh, that that actually mm. took place on the ground in political Rome. Yes. Uh, so Rome Rome was the main player, but it was fighting through Italy, it was fighting through Spain, it was fighting through, you know, and on the other side you have Britain and even Britain had a civil war where part of the people were Protestant and look at look at uh, look, look even in Ireland today. Okay? 
what's going on in Ireland? It is a war between different religion factors that are being fought inside the country. Yeah, that's very true. So we have the battle of the Shi'i and the battle of the Sunni going on here, and each time different nations. So let us bring us back to where we are. The guy that was killed, the main instigator, or the main how do you say, uh, casualty of the Iranians in this strike in Damascus was the commander of the Al-Quds Brigade in the whole Middle East. That's right. Now, what's the Al-Quds Brigade? The Al-Quds Brigade is us, Iran, bringing our fight for dominance, and the symbol of dominance in the Arab world is what? Yeah. Jerusalem. Yeah. Yep, that's right. Yeah. And and here here we go. So... What they brought down was the El Quds building, basically, that is part of. But here's another thing that I need people to start to understand. The enemy is very good at doing this kind of separation. Okay? The enemy is saying, it wasn't, Iran is saying, okay, we are not fighting this war. We're not attacking Israel, but the El Quds Brigade is attacking Israel. Iran is saying, we're not attacking Israel. The whole team are attacking Israel. So what... The deceiver does is he puts a a barrier, he puts a a wall between the instigator and the actual perpetrator. Hmm. Yeah, here we but go. But this is characteristic for them. Okay, we, like this is this is a regular, common. This is how they operate. This is their mo. Okay, for a lot of reasons. Okay, so so what we need to understand is this isn't uh, Iran is playing this game. But this is a building next to, this is a commander, this is a man who was wearing an Iranian Revolutionary Guard uniform, but he, by definition, wasn't, a re- wasn't part of the, the, the de facto government. So Israel did not take down an embassy, because that would have international ramifications. But it took down an organization whose designation was to conquer Jerusalem. Okay, so this gets even more interesting. Like this, this becomes even uh, a, a lot. This, there's a lot of important things that you touched up on. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> um, okay, so the faction thing, I just think is brilliant analysis because w- one of the things that I've always believed is I've always believed that the uh, the statehood designations never really mattered as much as the designations that are tied to the different beliefs from within the factions of islam right okay. by the way this is interesting because to, to to better prove my point in this and and actually more uh, uh give validity to the point that you're proving just stop for a second and provide some analysis for azerbaijan uh, it, it, you, if you look at what's going on over there and you begin to think about what's happening that is a picture perfect it is illustration fa- it of is. what you're talking about. Uh, well, I, I didn't invent the system. I mean, I've, I've been listening to a couple of Israeli scholars, uh, but basically they call it the camp war. I mean, uh, uh, I actually saw, uh, there's a YouTube video, I don't remember what his name is, he calls it the, the Game of Camps, as in the Game mm, of Thrones. interesting. The Game of Camps, and he, and he goes into to this. And, and here's the thing, the Palestinians are trying each time to grab each camp. Now, think about this. Hamas should have nothing to do with Iran, they are different camps. Completely. And now we're seeing this going over. But why is Iran willing? I mean, do you understand what Iran did to Hamas? Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're oh, yeah. if you're if you're a Hamas warrior and you think, oh, I'm going to bring, you know, I'm going to bring the jihad, I'm going to bring the flag of Islam to the world, I'm going to strike at the colonial, imperialistic, uh, Jewish, uh, Christian entity in in the world, I'm going to take my AK-47, crawl out of my hole attack and and suffer the repercussions and i'm going to bring the whole arab world is going to come up and follow me and and he comes out of his hole he does that he's getting bombed like crazy and he's about to lose and he say wait a minute where are my muslim brothers and and what does he get he gets from iran right now actually what he's getting is crickets yeah that's right that's right he's getting crickets that's right and and iran is saying wait a minute i'm not going to let them take the flag for the muslim world yeah, and, and that makes and sense. Again, people ask, why didn't Iran get into it? Because if the Hamas is the, the flag bearer of, of Islam, then what's the justification for Iran? What's the justification yeah. for the, the revolutionary army? And and that's why. And, and so what does Iran do? It says, okay, I've got my own proxies here. He gives a flag to the Houthis and say, do something. And uh, 
he gives the flag to whoever is part of his camp. So how do they retaliate against the attack? So the El Quds commander was killed in Beirut, in Damascus. That means, one, we've entered Damascus. Two, we've realized. Three, we've hit very close to the Iranian embassy, but we're very careful to put the— there's a wall, not a wall, there's a, there's a gap between the two buildings. Look at the picture. Yeah, One right. building is on the ground, the other building is standing up. That's right. Okay, and we're saying, okay— and we can do this, and, and Iran is saying, okay, then we need to make noise. And that's what happened in Eilat yesterday. I mm. don't know if you if you remember, or you heard the, the reports. So a... I, I did it. I didn't a, hear what happened slow in flying, Slow, low-flying drone. Because this is all during Easter, and I, I, that was a very busy oh, yeah, well, day for me yesterday, so I didn't, I didn't even hear this. So a slow, low-flying drone... <laughs> Flew uh, across the the um, the Red Sea, uh, the Gulf of Eilat, actually, no and hit the naval base. Israel has a naval base in in the southern port of Eilat, and actually hit the naval base. And we kind of tracked it back, and we realized that it came from Iraq, no less. So an Iraqi faction, under control of the Iranians shot a drone that crossed over Saudi airspace. How, that's my Jordanian question. How in the airspace. world? Jordanian airspace, Saudi airspace, Israeli entered Israeli airspace and hit an Israeli military target in Eilat. I mean, I, th this is the part that I don't understand. Because Slow. I want everybody to understand what, what this means. Look at the map. I mean, you if see this it. flies, if it, well, I don't need I don't need to look at the map. Yeah. I, I know the geography. <laughs> if this thing takes off, it's likely taking off somewhere on, this is my guess, I mean, I could be wrong, but it's probably taking off somewhere in the eastern portion of the Persian Gulf, the the, the, the border of Iran, or, the, or the, the coastal section of Iran along the Persian Gulf. It's probably taking off there. Okay. Okay? And you're 100% right. It has to cut across the Gulf. It no, may no, go, no, it may no, go no, north it of the Gulf. Iran. It came from Iraq. Iraq? Oh, it came from Iraq, not Iraq. Iran. I thought not you said Iran. Iran. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, it came from Iraq. Okay, that's a lot. That's a lot more believable to me. Okay. Now, if it came from Iraq, is it Iraqi or is it Iranian? It's well. Here's the thing. It was probably fired off by an Iranian proxy that is in Iraq, which means Iraq is not a nation state anymore. So this is so interesting. This is a pretty amazing development here. Well, yes, yes and no. I think I heard this wrong because I thought you told me Iran. No. So if it's coming out of Iraq. Yep. Again, the 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 camps, the, the my mind is going a million miles a second. How in the world? Because even with okay, look, even with Iraq, north of the Persian Gulf, the United States of America has a whole bunch of assets. That are designed to stop to, this guy. To, yeah, to supplement the function of Patriot missiles. Okay. So, I, I, like, so, how in the world does that work? How do we so, miss that? Okay, because, okay, you give something that is slow enough and, and low enough that it doesn't go up on into the radar. I mean, it, it could fly, you know, 50 feet off the ground the whole way. But how does that not get obsed by people? Oh, maybe, I don't well, know, man, go. that's so shocking to me. There you go. And it came over Jordan. It came over from the Jordanian side. So it has to have enough the fuel. Jordanian side. It has to have enough fuel to, to fly that far. Okay. It has to be high enough that it will not go over. Okay. Uh, it might not have crossed into Saudi. It might have come directly from Jordan. It would have to cross over Saudi Arabia. Not sure. Unless it took off from like Baghdad, it would have to. Uh, uh, my my guess is it was near the Kuwaiti border. It had to have been near the Kuwaiti border. How in the world? Everything along the border in Iraq, southern Iraq, everything along that border, along the Arabian Peninsula, we have assets on yep. over. It got through. Uh, by the way, it got through Israeli military air force. That's what defense. shocks me. Now, don't get me so wrong. So wait, you mean so, so it so it. It couldn't cross. Uh, it couldn't go across Jordan. There's no way. Why not? It would have to go. It would have to follow the northern border of Jordan. No, because that's where it's it least through, it likely came, to it have came, any detection. It came through Jordan. 
So here's my thing. If it goes straight through Jordan instead of the northern border of Jordan. It either came through Jordan or came through Saudi Arabia. I don't know if you know, but the, the, yeah, the yeah, Bay I know, of Eilat. I know. Bay of Eilat is where Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Israel connect. And Egypt, by the way. Yeah, Egypt as well. The, the, a part, well, part of what some people call old Sinai. But I know what you're talking but here, about. Here, I, want, I want to tie it together all together. Okay, thinking about it, We'll go back to if you want to go see, see what that means. Um, it didn't do any damage. Didn't kill anybody. Didn't stop anything. But it indicated to Israel, we can get here. So here's what happened. Israel took off, took out the main commander of the Iranian influence in Syria and Lebanon. The order to drive that drone across would have come from him? Maybe not from him. No, no. Maybe, maybe not from him. But the fact is that they did that in retaliation to what we did. What they did, though was a pin break. What we did is take out the commander. But now, that's disturbing to me, man. How now, in the world can that thing fly and go undetected across those nations? Well, Especially Jordan it's a, that has a treaty know, with Israel. We know that's what the Iranians do. That's how the Iranians attacked. Remember the uh, the gas uh, fields yeah, in Saudi yeah, Arabia? Yeah. Okay, again. And and again, um, maybe in... <laughs> And uh, I was messing around with a drone yesterday, and I know you're into drones and everything. Drone is, warfare is going to change a lot of things in, into what's going on, and, and Israel's got a wake-up call on this one. Yeah, I, I, uh, that one kind of shocks me because, I, again, I mean, where, where is there any place you can think of in Jordan outside of maybe where Petra is and part of Aqaba where the United States or Israel doesn't have some kind of an asset, detection asset. Yeah, but okay. Because of our treaty. Wait a minute, but here's the thing. Okay, let's put it low enough and slow enough. I guess, I guess you're right. I let's just don't put understand it low enough how. And you're flying through valleys. You're not getting up to a point where there's a sky behind, okay? And, and again, uh, maybe we should sit down and do a show about drones. Uh, that, that would be kind of cool. Yeah, we should, because I mean... Yeah, yeah, there's so many. And then the other question is, what kind of drone would it have been? Okay, but here's the thing. It did a very little amount of damage. Look, I, look, I get it. As a matter of fact, I, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate something because it's, this, this actually goes to the discussion that we're actually having. Uh, this, this drone base here, I'm, actually, I'm, I'm just going to just shoot the picture off. Okay. This is the one at uh, Qashan Airport. Which is this, where? this drone base. This is uh, this uh, is the middle of Iran. Yeah, I this see. is an Iranian drone base. Yep. Okay. We learned a lot from this. As a matter of fact, this is interesting because if I remember correctly, this is the defense ministry photo of it, this came from Iran's defense ministry, by the way. It was a propagandist tool that got out of their hands, and and we actually have this. Are they seeing this now? Uh yeah, they're seeing it right now. They're not seeing us, but they're but they're seeing this. Okay. What's, what's really interesting to me is when we found out about this base, we learned a lot about how these drones operate. And we adjusted accordingly how we detect these drones. This was three years ago. So drone detection has become a major issue. I don't know yeah, if you I know. Yes. Um, according to one of the pieces of information that I got is that the only way to take out drones like this is with laser systems. Yeah, laser systems or jamming technology. Or jamming technology. So, but 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 here's the thing, um, and maybe I shouldn't be going here, but this this even more puzzles me because if Israel, look, uh, we know this now. We okay. didn't know this at the time. October seventh, a significant portion in the exploitation of certain security assets. Involved drones. Yep. We, from all that we heard... By the way, in fact, a certain system that they had to overcome tanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we... we is Haven't we been hearing that that's been all shored up? How did we get one to elect? That's my question. Okay, so, so first of all, James, I, I remember looking at some of those helicopters you have in your office. Yeah. Okay. Um, they're drones and they're drones. There's these little tiny quad drones yeah, that we talk no, yeah, about. That, okay, well, they're not nothing, by the way. They took out tanks on the Gaza border. 
Yeah, but th those ones are probably, uh, they're not a handful. They're not like a hand size. The ones that you're talking about that took out those tanks are probably three feet. Three feet in, uh, fit, fit in, a, in, a, in a three foot, maybe a circle, maybe, yeah. th maybe three, three to six feet, yeah, right? But, uh, but, but that, and they, it is small, need, relatively well, speaking. All they need to do, by the way, is drop a hand grenade inside a tank hatch. Yeah. I mean, that's all yeah. you need to do, or yeah. fly into the hang yeah. tank hatch and, and explode inside. But that's one thing. The drone that we're talking about was probably the size of a small airplane, but it was mostly fuel, almost no ammunition, okay? And it had to be able to fly very, very, very low and very slow because what sparks off the detection systems is elevation and speed. Oh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. So, I mean, the drones that the Iranians are using to, to fight, they, they, they're selling them to the Russians that are, that are taking out tanks in Russia, have the motor of a lawnmower in the back. That's all you need. And if you have a big enough fuel system, if you have a big enough fuel tank, they can fly 1,000 miles. And basically that's what this did. Yeah, I mean, I have a helicopter that I'm building that has, in essence, a lawnmower engine in it. It's a little tiny, more like a chainsaw engine, but okay. it's the same. It's the same kind of construct. So, I mean, you got fuel, weight, power, but you know something like that. We're talking yeah. about we're talking about something like that. It didn't go up in the sky. I mean, it's not like the it's not like a rocket. I mean, you see a rocket going up. Okay, you detect it, you can aim it, and we did take out ballistic missiles. I mean, uh, but isn't the Iron Dome decide? Hasn't the Iron Dome been modified significantly? To be able to deal with drone attacks? Yes, basically, yes, and which is why we're trying to figure out what happened. Though I don't know if you remember, um, I mean, when's the last time you were in Elat? Oh, gosh, maybe you're with in, you. Yeah, when you're in Elat, you're in the Syrian yeah. African Rift. Yeah. You're way, way down below. Okay, you're on sea level, but all around you are mountains. So you're in the deep. So if a drone comes from across the Red Sea in Elat, which is as far as we are from, from uh, I don't know, just couple of blocks, okay? It could be able to come in fast enough. And again, Israel is trying to learn what happened and how this happened. What's slow to you? Can you give me like a speed? What would be slow? Anything under 100 miles an hour. Oh, so that does make sense. Goodness gracious. It must have taken, you know, 15 hours. Whatever. Yeah. And anyway. there are some drones that have that kind of capacity. Iran has become very good with those with those things. Iran has drones. By the way, um, unmanned planes, unmanned boats. I don't know if you know, but the the uh, Iraqis have taken out a couple of uh, major shipping assets in the Black Sea. Oh yeah, yeah. The Ukrainians. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. the The other thing that we know is that although Israel will never admit it, you know. That there are some assets that have that have harmed some serious assets. Or there are some there are some drones that have harmed some serious Israeli assets exactly. that people are not talking about. Yeah. We're trying to keep that undercover. Yeah, but that's that's interesting because Israel has been targeting very aggressively uh, Iranian drone technology, especially in well. Remember when they destroyed that big old factory, that drone factory. Yep. Okay, but the, the Iranians are doing a good job, including knocking down an American drone. Yeah, yep. And Iranians are very good, just like the Chinese of, of how do you say, back engineering? Yeah, reverse engineering. Reverse yeah. engineering, and, and that's what happened. So that's the situation right now, okay? Um, though I will say this, uh, Israel is poised to go into Rafiyah, so all the Israeli okay, news is Okay, can we talk about this? That. Can we talk about that as well? Yeah. The, the is go. Israel going into Rafiyah? Let's do it. Kamala Harris, that big, I, I, I'm, I'm just sorry. What do you mean? I mean, she's going to, if, if Biden wins the election, she's going to be the president. You know that. Bro, look, Kamala Harris just basically put Israel on notice two days ago and said, if you go into Rafah, there's going to be consequences. What the heck is she thinking? Well, the world is saying that. I mean, she's not the only one saying that. The Germans have said that. Uh, you know, the British. You should hear what what the um, the um, um, Irish Parliament is is standing up and saying about Israel. You know, on the floor of the Irish Parliament. I mean, terrible things. But 
Um, I think what she's thinking is that if she doesn't somehow manage to wave the flag of anti-Israel, then the Democrats are not going to win the election. Yeah. Well, because I'll tell you why. Listen, they're worried about uh, Michigan and they're worried about uh, um It'll come to me in just a second, but two two big states that are uh, very very strong Islamic influence, mm-hmm. and and the Muslims are saying we're not going to support you unless you come and and come out against. And again, there's the squad. I think you call them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, terrible people. So so they're all there. But again, in American politics, the anti-Israelism has become anti-Israelism, anti-Semitism has become the main glue that holds the left side of the political together. By the way, can I ask you a, a separate question? Because this got asked. Somebody wanted me, uh, the answer to this is very obvious to us, but somebody wanted me to ask you to explain this. Um, where did the term anti-Semitism come from? When we talk about uh, Semites, why is it only, why is it a term exclusive to Jews when we talk about anti-Semitism. Can you explain well, that? First of all, the term anti-Semitism means uh, as Semitic peoples yeah. are the people of the the son of Noah, yeah. okay, uh, the guy named Shem, yep. okay? He had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Yefet. Okay, the, the, the descendants of Shem are Semites, which include, by the way, the, the people of Israel because we're descendants from Abraham, but also include the Ishmaelites, yeah. who are descendants of yeah. Abraham. But also include the Amalekites, and also include the, the Canaanites, and also include all of the people that are in the gene- genealogy. So, so basically, anti-Semite should mean everybody who is of Middle Eastern descendant, everybody who is from that descendant of, of, uh, of Noah. But um, generically, it has been accepted over the years to mean anti-Jewish. Yeah, that's right. Yep, that's right. That's so, yeah, a good answer. So even though there are a lot of Shemites out there that are not included, we call anti-Semitism actually hatred of the Jewish people for being Jews. Yeah. Okay, so so again, I don't, that's, I don't know where the split actually was, but uh, I mean, you can't be, I, I mean, Arabs are anti-Semitic. Mm-hmm. Now, can a Jew be anti-Semitic? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Well, we saw somebody standing up in the Oscars, Schumer. in the Oscars a little while ago. <laughs> I uh, deny my my my, my Jewish my, heritage, whatever. Clown, what a clown! Again, I I keep on reminding people. We we know that Exodus. We had the people that were doing the same thing while ready for the Book of Exodus. Yep. Okay. Yeah. At what point do you? Uh, and this is off topic, but at what point do you actually transition from calling somebody ignorant to actually saying you're anti-Semitic? Because there's a lot of people who are very ignorant. They don't really know what's happening. And so they, they just jump on the bandwagon of condemning, but they don't know the real story. And in many cases would actually change their minds if they did understand the real story. Where, uh, where do you draw the line? How do, how, how do you create that distinction? I'm, I'm going to kind of see if maybe, and I, I'm, I'm kind of formulating this as we go, but let's see if I can explain it like you would explain explain to a child. I mean... If you are a uh, young boy growing up anywhere, okay, um, you know, you know, there's a difference between you and girls, okay, and you might not even like the fact that girls wear dresses and you wear pants, okay, but uh, that's just normal. I am me, and you are you. When you start hating girls because of their girlishness. You become something more than just I don't like the difference. Yeah. Okay. okay. That, that's a good explanation. So, so if you understand that there are different peoples, okay? Mm-hmm. There, there's Jews, there's Arabs, there's different peoples, and there's even differences, and and we can talk about the differences. But when you actively hate somebody just because of that difference, then it's it it becomes an anti-Semitism. I I can not like somebody. I don't like this guy because he acts and behaves something. But here's the thing. It's like when when something goes personal, I mean, it's not your fault. It's because of what you are. Then that hatred becomes what we, what we call, um, um, how do you say, um, profiling. You, when you profile somebody because of their background, that's when it, I mean, I, I, I tell you what, I can, there's a lot of things about Jews that I don't like. Okay. Yeah. A lot of things that I Jews. Again, we don't like this. We don't like that. When it becomes, okay, it's because you're Jewish. 
Okay, you did this because it's, you're Jewish, not because of the way you act, not the be- kind you you behave. Now you understand that all of these anti-Semites and everything is completely anti-Christian, hmm. because in Christianity, God makes it very clear. Jesus makes it very clear. We're responsible for who and what we are. It doesn't matter if we're Greek or we're Jews or whatever. You stand before God with whatever you do or don't do. You are responsible before God for what you are. It doesn't matter who your father was. It doesn't matter who you're born from. So so that's that's more or less the line that we can kind of designate. Though the, the very interesting discussion would be what's the difference between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. And, and in order to, to go into that, if anti-Semitism is the hatred of the Jews for their Judaism, anti-Zionism is the hatred of somebody who is a Zionist. And if you ask what a Zionist is, a Zionist is a person who believes in the prophecies of the Bible, basically yeah. that Jews should live in God's land. So the chosen people should live in the promised land. That is Zionist. By definition, chosen people, yeah. promised land is what Zionism is. And a lot of people are saying, we're not against the Jews. We're just against the Jews being in the promised land, yeah, which is what Zionism. I mean, you might as well be against the Jews. I mean, yeah, that's I really mean, that, that you're they're, against, they're hand in hand. You're against the Jews doing what God told them to do. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's just ridiculous. It's it's like, well, I got nothing against the Jews. I just have something against them breathing my air. It's, a, it's the same kind of ridiculousness. So I need your help on something, though. Can yeah. I ask a question? Yeah, 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 of course. Okay, what's this whole uh, Biden and, and Easter bunny no. uh, thing going on? Okay. Now, I, I'm, I'm new to Easter. This is my first Easter here. And I, I have a weird, I mean, somebody tried to explain the whole Easter bunny thing to me. Yeah. That in itself is a balagan. It is. It's it's pagan. Bunny, the whole Easter bunny, bunny thing is, is, is pagan. But yeah. what is, what's Biden writing on here? So Joe Biden is a is an evil man. He just look, and the people handling him are evil men. He he declared Easter Sunday to be a national day of transgender recognition. Okay, now here's the thing: they have been declaring March 31st that day, March 31st that day for years, but it has to be declared every single year. And this year, he signed that declaration on Good Friday. Regarding Easter Sunday, and then when they had the Easter egg hunt at the White House, which is a very traditional thing, you know, they they take these eggs and they're supposed to decorate them. And this part of this part of this process, there's a lot of people who will take those eggs and put Christian themes on the eggs as a way of taking what used to be a symbolic, uh, a, a pagan symbolic kind of a thing and turning it into something that has relevance to our story, right? The story of the resurrection. Um, by the way, it's it's really funny too about the definition of Easter. Some people talk about it, you know, Easter referring it meaning it came from the word Ishtar and all of that. That's not actually the case, believe it or not. As a matter of fact, the real origin of the word Easter centers around a a, a specific. Um, uh, word speaking about sunrise, right? Oh, interesting. Which which is a description of the condition under the resurrection of Christ, right? Um, it over the years that got lost, and there's a lot of confusion about it, and there's a lot of back and forth as into what. Still haven't that, figured what, how the bunnies got into. Yeah, it. so so the bunny is a thing, uh, a symbol of, fer- of fertility. It's a pagan god symbol of fertility, right? So that's why the Easter bunny is. Um, is kind of a big thing because the false gods that are being worshipped and honored uh, during this season is it's a spring thing. It's a fertility, the god of fertility. The god, you know, it's a, it's a god that is other than the god of our fathers. So um, this is why there's a lot of people that run back and forth and go, oh, "It's such a pagan thing. It's a pagan thing." Well, by Biden saying we don't want you to bring any religious reference into these eggs, he's in essence saying. I want the paganistic culture of this to be honored as it is without with, the, without any acknowledgement of the resurrection of Christ. Which, without the Christian symbolism. Yeah, which, by the way, when we celebrate Easter, we're not celebrating the Easter bunny. We're not celebrating. Uh, we are celebrating the resurrection of Christ Jesus. And the White House would not acknowledge it. The White House did not say anything. As a matter of fact, on the contrary, the White House made it their position to create a a day of acknowledgement or whatever you want to call it 
you know, which, by the way, is disgusting. It's Joe Biden spitting in our face. But it, it's just another. Okay, here, here's me looking at what's going on. OK, I'm seeing that the hatred of Israel is becoming a symbol of being on the left side of the political. Oh, absolutely. hundred percent. The de-association of Christianity is on the left side of the hundred percent. So, so we're it's seeing, what drives that anti-Semitism. Okay, so so we're we're seeing this polarization in American society, which basically, if you do want to have support for Israel and you do want to have support for Christian values, okay, you cannot be a part of the Democratic Party. Hundred percent. You can't. You cannot be a believer and be someone who ascribes to the to the beliefs of the Democratic Party. There's no way. You can't be a Christian and, and, and be a Democrat. So where, where are the Christian Democrats? I mean, they're gone because a lot of the... Lot of, There's uh, no such the thing. The Democratic Party was Christian in essence in the beginning. Yeah, maybe. I don't... I, uh, if they are, then they're like my mom and my dad who came to America and became Democrats because they were told when they came into America, that's what you should be. They didn't know any better. Okay, so, so if this is the polarization... Then we know, and and again, I, I I said it a couple of hours ago on a, on a different kind of connection. Do me a favor, make sure for Israel, for Israel's reason, make sure we know who's getting into the White House. I I say this again and again and again and again. President Trump was the best thing for Israel, probably of any other president we've had. Will and, he bring back the Easter Bunny? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you this. I can tell you that we've never had a president selling a Bible to raise money for his campaign. Mm. This president's doing that. Oh, uh, not not Biden, President Trump. Um, I I admire what he did for Israel. Well, we do. I mean, I mean more so than even Truman. We, we miss him. We Israel's miss him. Yeah, yeah. Of course, him. of course. Listen, uh, if if Trump were president right now. I don't even think we'd see the kind of aggression that we're watching towards Israel by Hezbollah, by Iran, or even by by uh, the Houthis. Uh, maybe Hamas, maybe, but that wouldn't last long. Okay, but again, part of the polarization that we did. Okay, so we are living in a, in a world where appeasement is a policy. Yep. Okay, and uh, again, anti-biblical. Bible says there are things that are right, there are things that are wrong. You 100%. never, You never... Learn to live with, you don't sleep with, you don't eat with, you don't dine with, you don't connect with everything that is wrong, that is evil. 100%. But we're living in a world where, okay, the the, the deceiver has managed to deceive us into understanding, or a lot of us, to understanding that there's no such thing as evil, there's no such thing as, there's no good, there's no bad, it's all versions of, of this. So if there's no good and there's no evil, then then basically if somebody evil comes to kill to kill you, it makes sense to try to convince him not to. And if That's he right. does, he does. If he doesn't, he doesn't. And we're in a world of appeasement. And yep. your government is doing this, which is why I'm hearing people say, I mean, I'm hearing people say, why don't we just sit down and talk to Hamas? And and I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it when people say, okay, uh, we demand a ceasefire now and a return of all the hostages. And I'm saying to myself, wait a minute. I mean, you're you're the the city council of, of Chicago has decreed, okay, that there should be a ceasefire now. I mean, what what are you talking about? The city of Chicago, the city of Chicago decreeing that there should be some kind of a, a ceasefire is one of the most obscene, absurd, ridiculous statements I've ever made. And that that clown mayor won't declare a ceasefire in his own city. So what a, what a clown. No. And, and again, here's the thing. Truth doesn't matter. I mean, I'm seeing some of the things that they're saying about Israel. And I know are wrong. You know are wrong. Probably even the people saying them know they're wrong. But it doesn't matter. If they say it and they get enough likes. I mean, Joe Rogan. I mean... If if he if he's liked enough, then then what do you what are you going to say? And we're living in a world of likes. I I think that um, regardless of how bad that side of it is getting, the obligation sits with us to just continue to tell the truth. And I think the better we become at telling the truth, the more effective the message is. Um, and I think that that's that's perhaps the most significant part of all of this. You know, the fact that we have to go out of our way and walk people through the very thing that we're doing right now. You you, you have to you have to make people understand what's really going on, right? And this is this is a really big deal. And I think that Damascus is going to continue to get bombed. Um, 
I think we're going to continue to have those problems and there's going to always be people looking for and seeking to find a reason and they're going to do it again and 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 again to condemn the actions of Israel even though Israel is not worthy of those condemnations. Uh, it's. I, I like the idea, though, of people sitting here and saying, I know what's going on there. I mean, podcast. They're saying, yeah, but this happened, so that means one, two, three. And I'm saying to myself, wait a minute, you, you're you not there. You don't no, know. No, they don't know. You no, don't know. Don't you know. don't know. By the way, you don't know for this side, and you don't know for that side. Yeah, it doesn't matter. True. So how do you decide who is right and who is wrong? Yeah. You basically base it on the amount of likes that each side has. Well, and that's the part. Like These people are just sitting in their own bubbles, and they don't really understand the real perspective on this. My favorite ones are the ones that are like, Free Palestine, free Palestine, and they're uh, doing their gay rights shirts. And they're if you were in downtown Gaza for five seconds, listen, if you were in Rafa for five seconds, you're dead. Um, interesting, interesting dynamic I, I heard yesterday, day before yesterday, sorry, about, uh, did you come up, did you hear the accusations that Israeli soldiers are raping Palestinian women in Gaza? It's ridiculous. They've minute. been saying this now for, for months, They've bro. They've stopped. Okay? And here's 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 why they stopped. And I heard a very interesting podcast. Al Jazeera started pushing it. A lot of the news started pushing it. And all of a sudden, they stopped pushing it. Now, here's the thing. Okay, it's a lie. It's a libel. Okay? But here's the thing. They were pushing it for a while. They found somebody to stand up and say... My sister told me that she was raped by the Israelis, one, two, three, four. Uh, there was a connection between Israelis uh, raping at the El Shifa, in the El Shifa hospital. Okay, and, and she said, we're living around this and, and we were molested and, and we're afraid to go out. But then it stopped. And, and I heard a very interesting podcast by an Israeli scholar. He says, then why did it stop? I mean, if, if they're willing to lie about the numbers of the people getting killed, they're willing to lie about what's happening, they're willing to lie about everything, why did they stop that? Yeah, that's true. And, and, the, and, and, and somebody sat down and says, you have to understand Muslim society, okay, in order to understand. These are deeply religious, fundamentalist Muslims. Mm -hmm. yep. A woman who is raped cannot get married. A woman who is raped is ostracized by her own society. A woman who is raped in this society because it is considered no, kind of no, natural process. It is considered normal behavior to rape women as part of the political. So the women that are raped, okay, are going to be ostracized by their own society and, and they won't be able to get married. They won't be able to have children. They, they will not be able to do anything. So quit saying that our women were raped. Well, I mean... What I'm trying to say is this is such a deeply, how do you say, uh, what do you call, patriarchal, religious, yeah, fanatical yeah, it's true. society. It's true. That even if a woman is raped, she carries the brunt of the, the uh, um, in their society, uh, she carries the brunt of the, the um, how do you say, the um, punishment for that. Yeah. Okay. They're so deeply patriarchal that even they blame the rape victim for being raped. And and here's the thing. And again, besides the, the libel against, don't you see what you're dealing with here? Oh, 100%. 100%. No, but, the, no, but somebody's going to stand up and say, oh, the Jews are raping Muslim women. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. 100%. Just the kind of incident that you could create alone in, in, in something like that, if it were actually legitimate and verified amongst the tribal factions, that exist in Islam it would 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 just be unthinkable. It's interesting. So, it's interesting. I, I, I found it fascinating that they are they are actually stopping the the lie because it is actually painting their own women. Yeah, it's hurting them as victims in in the wrong. And and I'm saying, look at how deeply patriarchal this society is. Yeah. And you want to be a queer in Gaza? <laughs> it's never going to work. <laughs> it's never going to work. It's. Chickens for KFC. There you go. It's it's just, it's never going to work. Okay, closing thoughts, closing ideas here. We're we're up on the hour mark, and um, I've kept you for a while, and we're Hezbollah, near the end of the day. Hezbollah, Hezbollah is, is, okay, what is going to happen with Iran now as a result of this attack in Damascus? We've taken out one of the, I mean, this is this is on par with the United States taking out Soleimani. I don't know if you remember. Oh, the, yeah, the, it was the a big Baghdad deal. Airport. 
Okay, so so what is going to happen? What is what are the repercussions of that going to be? And I don't think it's going to end with the firing of a, of an airplane at a naval base in in Iraq. Yeah, because they they found a, a a kink in the armor, and they okay, so so they kind of did something on that one. Fine. What's going to happen now? And again, we're seeing that the Iranians are not ready to light the ring of fire. Now, I've got a whole theory about why, and and maybe we can expand on this if you don't. But I think the Iranians are not ready for for the big showdown with the West that they're agree. talking about. I would I would hundred percent agree. Okay, but what are they lacking? I mean, look what they're doing with the Houthis. Look at what the what 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 it's, what's the element? What what arrow do the Iranians want in their quiver that they don't have? Yeah, and and the answer is the nuclear issue. Yeah. Listen, I mean, if you'd asked me in uh, a year ago, what's the most more important? Um, um, threat to the state of Israel is the nuclear opera in, in Iran. Nobody would have ever said Hamas. Mm. And Israel was on the verge of taking out the nuclear option because we see that as a major threat. And I think, remember we talked about the three camps? Oh, yeah. I think that the Shi'i camp, okay, is the biggest one because they are totally, totally religiously motivated. And Well, but, but for the record, not to cut you off, the Shi'ite is the minority, they're the smallest faction. They're probably four percent of all of Islam, but when you say they're the most, uh, uh, they're they're the biggest one, meaning they are going to give, they're going to have the biggest punch. They're the they're the most organized. They're the most aggressive. They represent the largest army in the Middle East. They they are. Uh, is, is that is that how I'm understanding you? Yes, but here's okay. the thing. Think about Iran and everything that we're talking about. We've been talking about now, right? With the possession of a nuclear weapon. Oh my goodness! I it's, it's the, the whole thing is completely different. Yeah, and I believe that the reason Iran is holding back right now, and I'm again, I'm not a scholar, I'm not a, I'm not a specialist, I'm not an analyst, but Iran is waiting for that extra arrow in its quiver because if Iran had a nuclear weapon somewhere in the basement in Iran, the whole dynamic of the Middle East that we're talking about, these different camps and everything would be completely different because hmm. if they can blow up a nuclear weapon in Israel or, by the way, it doesn't have to be Israel. Think about the threat that you would if, if they blew up a nuclear facility in, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. I mean, Saudi Arabia is nothing without oil. Nothing. I yep. mean, literally nothing. Right. Okay, one or two, um, how do you say, bombs like this could completely destroy Saudi Arabia. Hmm. I mean, think how, how sensitive it is. The country is huge, but you don't need to blow up the whole country. All you need to do is blow up a, an oil facility and, and the Saudi uh, economy crumbles. So if they had that option, they would be much more powerful. The The whole Cold War, and, and I mean, go back to the, the, the Cold War in, in Europe and in, in the world in the 1960s and 70s, okay? The Cold War wouldn't have happened if then, if the Russians didn't have a nuclear option. Yeah, no, you're right. You know, come on, give me a break. Not even close. We wouldn't have seen the Cuba Missile Crisis. We wouldn't have seen any of that kind of stuff. You wouldn't That's have right, seen 100%. Even, you wouldn't even, you, they wouldn't have had the power. They yeah, wouldn't no have way. the influence. 100%. They wouldn't have anything. 100%. So I think Iran is looking for, waiting for, getting close to, and here's the thing. We haven't been talking about the Iranian nuclear ability. We haven't been talking about all the, remember all the, the committees that we're going through? Bro. Remember everything? And it's been completely backlogged, being completely sidelined. Nobody's talking about it. One of and the nobody will talk about it about it because you can't come to the Germans now and say Iran nuclear weapon. They they're dealing with Hamas, they're dealing with Gaza, they're dealing with genocide. Yeah, that's right. And and the, the thing is perhaps one of the most powerful one of these days I'm going to re-air it. One of these days we should we should we should re-air it together and go over this. One of the most powerful presentations you will ever see on the nuclear problem in Iran was Netanyahu in the United when he Nations. went before the United Nations and told them, showed them the data that they had on what was going on, and pretty much dropped his pants and peed all over the JCPOA. And nobody's talking about it now. No way. Nobody. As a matter of fact, there were people in the United Nothing that actually wanted to draft a joint resolution condemning his speech. Yep. So here we go. How does that work, even? I think the, the, the summary on this one is we've got to speak up. We've got to speak loud. We've got to use our scope of influence to tell people the truth about all of these things. We have to, you guys, we have to pray for the nation of Israel yep. and we have to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The, 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 look, more than ever, this is, by the way, I don't know if you know this, I pray this with my children every single night. 
When, when we call, I call my little brother Joseph, I mean, I call Jane and I pray with my little brother Joseph. My kids are always with me when we pray. And that is the that is the way, we, it's the last prayer. It's the last thing that I pray at the end of our prayer. And we, we, we pray for, you know, we pray for a while. And the last, the last prayer that we pray is, Lord, protect the nation of Israel and bring peace to Jerusalem. It's our, it's our every, it's, 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 Every single day without fail, it is what we pray. So and, and I want to comment on something that's kind of been bouncing around my mind lately. Every time I talk to you, sit he, sitting here, you talk about your family. You talk about your kids. You talk oh, about yeah. your wife. You talk about the interactions between you and your wife. That's something very not Western. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> but I'm not so Western. There you go. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's true. And 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 here is is something very, very interesting that, that kind of, I, I, again, I've been listening to a couple of people who kind of talk about this, but Israel is a very unique, if you want to put a combination, between Western civilization, Western ideology, Western mentality, Western um, r rule of law, nationalism, but we still have some of the original tribalism, familyism, okay, left behind. Yeah. Uh, I think I, re I read a statistic a little while ago that the um, among high-tech entrepreneurs, I mean people who are up in the high-tech mm -hmm. world, okay, the amount of children that high-tech employees in Israel have compared to the amount of children that high-tech employees have in Los Angeles oh, is crazy. You can't even compare. Exactly. So even people at the top of the technological pyramid yep. in Israel still have a family connection. 100%. People on the top of the technological pyramid in, in, in the Western world almost completely disregard the family. 100%. And, and that's one of the uniqueness of Israel is that on one hand we do have – Western technology, science, but we still have the family connection, okay? And and I, it just dawned on me that every time you talk about your family, it's not something that in the West people do on a regular basis. No, 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 no. And the other thing, I mean, look, I mean, you know this, and we all understand this, right? Our, our family and our children are a central part of our lives. People here in the United States of America, at least the left, um, says the patriarchy is evil. And, the, and you know, look, patriarchal culture is is God's design. It's how, it's, it's how God put it all together. When you look at Abraham and the culture that Abraham uh, facilitated, it was inspired by the Lord himself. It's founded on the, the just the basic fundamentals of creation. God gives five commands when he creates mankind in Genesis, right? He says, be fruitful. He says, multiply. He says, have dominion. He says, replenish and subdue. These are, these are the commands that he gives us, and you're not going to do it without that patriarchal familial, familial structure. You, and, and listen, I mean, you tell me. I mean, look, we, we talk about even children being balagan sometimes, right? And all of us know what that's like. Oh, believe yeah. me. Yeah, but you I know what? I don't know if my kids are hearing me, but they're... Yeah, they're balagan, plenty of balagan. But you know what? I, I've lost count how many times you talk to me about how much you love your children. <laughs> And how much you care about them. And just even right now, it look, it's beginning to bring tears to your eyes. It's hard not to be affected by it because our family means everything to us. We love our families. And, and that's why we do what we do. We do it for our children. Yeah, but that's that's part of the Middle Eastern part. That's that's part of it's the true. Middle Eastern of where we are. Okay. It's and true. what I'm trying to say is don't lose the family connection. I mean Amen. You know, you know where I where I noticed it starting. Okay. Um, when I was growing up, family sitcoms were a basic part of the way of life. Oh, sure. Okay, but then it started going weird on oh, weird man. families, okay? And then I don't know if you remember, I remember sitcoms about, uh, you know, three dads and, and, and girls oh, yeah. and all kinds of weird stuff like oh, that. Yeah. And today, family sitcoms are non-existent. Yeah, they don't exist anymore, 100%. And by the way, there were people that were called crazy for saying that the day will come when those won't exist anymore, when everything was going crazy. And they were called crazy, and they're right. I mean, look at this. Now we can't even tell the difference between a boy and a girl. I mean, that's that's the world we're going in. Uh, and these people, all these people that propagate this nonsense, they don't. They know. Yeah. They're just choosing to, to to propagate something because of a, I don't know, cultural Marxist idealism. That's, that's just what it is. It's really disgusting. But it's, you know, the bottom line is, really, when you come down to it, 
Western society and Western civilization and Western culture has departed so much from the word of God that all of these principles are far from us. I never thought I would see the day where somebody would tell me, that's not so Western of you to talk about your family all the time. But that's the truth. That's exactly what's become. Exactly. It's very true. Exactly. It's very true. It's and our families family. were all about this. That's it. This is this is so, what we're about. So they're going to go, okay, so they're going to call you a racist. And they're oh, going to say, why everything. am I a racist? They say, wait a minute, do you have a father? Yes, then you're a racist. Yeah. Oh. It's imperialism. Everybody, okay. So, all right, do you know your father? Then you're racist. Oh, no. Do you know your kids? Are you racist? Bro, I mean, one of the core tenets of Black Lives Matter when they were founded, they took it off their website because how controversial it became, was they believe in the destruction of the nuclear family. Yeah. Which I, I, you can't see what's going on. What's next? So it's, it's, it's the work of Satan. It's it, Satan's done this from the very beginning. You can see the practical application of it from the very beginning, and we're seeing it again. So, um, men, stay in the lives of your children. Amen. Okay. Yep. Be a part of their lives. Teach young boys what it means to be masculine. Teach young boys what it means to be a man. Amen. Teach the provide and protect. Protect that is our basic role, and 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 this is something that we've got to kind of somehow connect again because I'm seeing again here in California, so many so many families are not nuclear families anymore. Hundred percent, bro, and it's it's really bad. It's getting bad, but it's true. It's absolutely true. All right, all right, bro. What's well, that next? was a good one. All right, it's a good yeah. conversation. <laughs> we've uh, we've been at this for an hour and fifteen minutes already. Wow. It's just crazy. So let's see what's going to happen this week. Pray for us that yeah. uh, this week's going to kind of... Israel's about to go into Rafiq. That's that's the main issue. And the question is what's going to happen in Rafiq, what's going to happen in Israeli politics, yep. and what's going to happen with the world when Israel pushes that button and goes in. Let's close in prayer right now. It's a good idea. Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your faithfulness to us, Lord. And we do pray right now for the nation of Israel, Lord. We pray, God, that as... They move into that area, Lord, in, in, in Rafa, Lord. We just pray that, Lord, you would give them strength and wisdom, that, Lord, you would protect uh, innocent human life. And, Father, please, please, please help, help Israel to protect and to save these hostages, Lord. Bring them home, Lord. That's our prayer, Lord. We also pray, God, for the... Uh, for the success of the nation right now, Lord. Father, that you would protect and bring peace, Lord, to Jerusalem. And Father, we just pray, God, for all of your people, Lord, uh, not just Christians, Lord, but your ancestrally chosen people, the Jews, Lord. We pray for your protection upon them, Lord. We love them so much. And we pray, God, that you'd give us a heart for them and that we continue to pray for them, Lord. So we love you. We thank you, Lord. We pray for David's ministry. We pray for your blessing upon his ministry, Lord. And we just look to you. We thank you. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys, we love you. Keep See fighting the good time. fight. Pray for the memorial service for Pastor Jeff that's happening this Saturday. Yep. It's going to be a big deal. David's going Pray back to Israel. David's going back to Israel for a few weeks. You guys will be hearing from him when he's over there, uh, yep, which definitely. will be a lot of fun. And then he'll be back with us. And we've got some big projects around the corner. I'm really excited about it. Let's okay. Go. Love you guys. And then we got another release of the uh, one of David's videos on Balagan Connection. I'm not sure if it'll be done today or in the next day or two, but be on the lookout for that as well. Okay? See you soon. Love you guys. God bless you.